All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, bringing you all the best JavaScript news in a podcast form. And this is episode 79. We don't actually have that many things today for whatever reason. Like, there's some news, some uh, bit sized awesomeness, and a couple of releases. But you know what? Let's just get going. I guess it's good for me because I've been under weather for the past couple of days. So I'm not exactly my best self now. So apologize if anything goes sideways, although, you know, it typically does. So um, here we are. <laughs> All right, let's um, get cracking. The first section as always is getting started. And the first article we got here today is JavaScript iterators and generators part two synchronous. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Let me try that again. Part two synchronous generators. So Last podcast, we had the synchronous iterators article that talked about the iteration protocol and everything. And this time around from the same author, we got the generators explanation. It's a really good one as well. Uh, so if you are getting into JavaScript and you are confused as to what the generators are, how do they work, how do you use them and when you might need to use them, this is a really good explanation and uh, probably one of the best articles you can get started with. Next article we got here is WebAssembly modules in Rust, an introduction. A pretty nice write up on uh, how to create your own first WebAssembly module using Rust. It does not explain how the Rust works and doesn't teach the Rust language, which you know is a completely different story, but it does tell you uh, how do you get started with building your own WebAssembly Rust module explains what the, what the VASM pack is, how to use it, what the VASM bind gen is, and how do you apply it in your Rust code, and so on and so forth. Uh, so if you're interested, do check it out. Also, if you're interested in WebAssembly and Rust, I did a live stream this week on exactly the topic. We built a simple markdown module using Rust and compiled it to WebAssembly and then compared the performance between the JavaScript uh, markdown compiler and the WebAssembly markdown compiler. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. All right, next article we got here is creating an object validator in JavaScript, this test driven development way. So this is sort of a mixed or combined, I guess, introduction to test driven development and to object validation, right? So it sort of uh, introduces you to what test driven development is and how do you apply it by building this object validation uh, library, I guess. Uh, it's a very straightforward, very nice tutorial. So if you were curious about test driven development, but couldn't quite grasp the concept, I guess this does a very good job of uh, showing it is showing what it is on, um, you know, using the examples uh, rather than just talking abstractly. So I think this might be very good for some people who are better understand material when uh, given the examples, let's put it this way. Um, I guess if you are also was interested, how do you write your own validators, this might be good, but the validation bit is not exactly that complex here. The most of the focus the article does is on the test driven development itself. Right, going uh, next, we got debugging TypeScript in Firefox DevTools. This is an official write up from the Mozilla hacks. And it's a really good one. So if you're working with TypeScript, and if you were curious, as to how you could better debug it using Firefox DevTools, then well, this is your answer. It walks you through just about everything you have to know about uh, debugging TypeScript in Firefox, source maps, jumping to generated locations, and so on and so forth. So it's a really good write up and a pretty good tutorial to get you started in no time, basically. All right, next thing we got here is how to CI and CD a Node.js applications in GitHub Actions. CI and CD in this case referring to a continuous integration and continuous deployment. And uh, yeah, this is basically a tutorial for GitHub Actions that just shows you off how you can use them. I'm, I wouldn't say continuous deployment in this case because the tutorial itself just talks about building the Docker image and pushing it to Docker Hub, which is just one part of deployment, right? So you still have to deploy it somewhere, but um, yeah, I mean, GitHub Actions look really nice and the workflow here is super straightforward. Like you have actions for just about everything you want and then you just specify the action you want to run essentially, that looks quite awesome. So I'm quite excited to um, get the my hands on GitHub Actions and I think I'm gonna do a stream about them at one point showing off how to do continuous deployment, you know, as in really deploying your stuff uh, to your server at some point. So um, nonetheless, if you want to get started with GitHub Actions and uh, curious as to what you can do with them and how hard it is, then this is a pretty good article. 
Next thing we got here is introduction to D3JS. A really cool set, I mean, I guess you could call it an article, but it's more of like a full website because there is a ton of topics here that shows you off how to work with D3JS, including grabbing data, manipulating data, manipulating DOM, drawing SVG shapes, dealing with colors, dealing with date times, animations, well, basically everything you have to know to work with D3JS. So if you were curious about D3JS, if you wanted to get started with it, but were confused by it or were scared by the API surface because it might be very intimidating when you just get started with it, it does have a lot of features. Um, this is a really good point to start. Like there is a ton of things, they are very well explained and there's interactive, uh, yeah, let me try that again, interactive examples that you can literally just run here and copy to your clipboard if you want to and try in your own uh, code. So this is super nice, super convenient and um, probably will explain everything you need to know about D3JS to start building your own visualizations. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. All right, that is it for the getting started section. Now we are into the articles and news and we only have one article this time around, although it's a pretty good one. Uh, it's titled Publishing an NPM Package Best Practices and is sort of nearly comprehensive guide on publishing your code to the NPM. So if you ever wanted to build a package or you already built something and maintain something, um, maybe you are unsure about some of the things like module system, maybe you're just getting started with JavaScript and you are not sure about the whole AMD ES6 and so on and so forth modules. Uh, maybe you're unsure about the building, TypeScript definitions, documentation, log depend dependency locking, security considerations. This article got you covered. So all of that is described here. All of that is uh, kind of outlined at least. There is a lot of things that are just basically briefly mentioned or, or referenced to other um, websites or articles that explain them in more details. But I think this is a pretty good starting point, especially if you're just getting started with publishing your stuff to NPM. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. Right, now we're coming to the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. The first tiny thing we got here is adding notch support to your React Native apps, Android, iOS and web. So this is a React Native specific tutorial and this is one of those things that actually bite you quite a bit when you don't think about it. So the notch thing is, you know, as annoying as it might be, it's actually quite widespread nowadays, right? And you have to think about it when you're building mobile apps, well, in any language, but in React Native specifically as well, right? The cool thing is React Native actually has quite a bunch of um, user land packages that make it a lot easier to actually work with Notch. Uh, one of them is shown here is this use safe area, safe area context. Uh, but I personally prefer the view one. I don't think the article actually mentions it. So wait a second. That was the React Native safe view, I believe. Uh, yes, safe area view, there we go. It's, it's part of React Native itself now, is it? Seems so. So instead of doing the context-based uh, thing, you can just use this and it will handle the notch for you, which is quite convenient. But nonetheless, there is a bunch of other approaches, uh, including this uh, use safe area hook. So if you're interested, do check it out. Next thing we got here is the, did you know that set timeout doesn't play well with really large numbers? This is something I didn't know actually before and it looks um, extremely amusing. And I mean, I guess nobody would ever use set timeout with numbers as large as this, right? So you, would, you wouldn't typically need to do anything like this. Let's just put it this way. If you have a task that are this long running, you would probably use something like cron on the back end and on the front end, you just don't need them at all, right? But it's a good thing to like, good thing to know, I guess, and to keep in your mind that if you try to set timeout with infinity and number max integer, it will actually execute almost immediately. So um, yeah, there you go. Just keep this in mind. It's also quite, I would be quite interested to read a write up on how exactly that works and why that happens from maybe VA team or something. They typically tend to dive in into this quite a bit, but it is fascinating detail anyway. All right, continuing, we got uh, Mozilla's Manifest V3 FAQ, a pretty nice set of questions and answers about the Manifest V3 that will be changing the extensions API, specifically in Chrome and uh, well Firefox as well. 
And the Mozilla stands on uh, quite a bit of positions that the Google took within to, you know, the declarative net request, the ad blocking and limiting the set of resources, the number of resources you can block. And Mozilla essentially says, hey, we're not going to do that. We're going to be as flexible as ever. And the ad blockers will still work as expected in Firefox. So I guess uh, if Google does really go through with that change, so one more reason to switch back to Firefox. There you go. If you're curious, do check out the whole FAQ. There is a bit more information here. All right, next thing we got here is the Rocket Fast Embedded TypeScript for Make Code Arcade. This is a blog, uh, an article published at the Microsoft Research Blog, and it talks about their Make Code Arcade platform that is sort of a combination of um, web UI editor with code. Uh, I'm not sure. Like, okay, there's a code environment, right? There's an online editor that allows you to edit code in that environment. There's an online uh, simulator. And there's then the last bit is this uh, microcontroller based devices that can run the games that you write in this online editor. Now, the thing is that they build the whole thing in TypeScript. And originally, they tried to put the TypeScript on microcontrollers. And while that worked to some extent, by using stuff like IoTJS, DuckTape.js, and MicroPython, which is you know the embeddable JavaScript and Python engines, they uh, the article here describes that they actually hit the performance issues because the microcontrollers typically have uh, something between two and two hundred fifty six kilobytes of RAM, so the RAM resource is super tiny, right? And as you might know, interpreted languages are quite heavy on RAM, JavaScript specifically. So even the embeddable JavaScript engines were not performing quite good enough. So what the, the good people of the Microsoft research did is they created a static TypeScript, which is a subset of TypeScript that is uh, statically compiled to ARM bytecode, which is absolutely insane. So um, yeah, they just they just made a statically compiled TypeScript, which is compiled to ARM bytecode and then bundled together with a C engine. And then you can use TypeScript. I mean, it is a subset of TypeScript, so some things are missing from it, but still you can use it to build um, very tiny games that run on uh, microcontrollers that have 100 megahertz CPUs and 100 kilobytes of RAM, which is absolutely mind blowing, to be honest. Um, the article has a bit more details as to how that works. There's also a scientific paper from them uh, explaining this in more detail, which is uh, quite impressive, to be honest. Like, this is really cool. So, this is not WebAssembly, just to note this, they do compile it to ARM code directly. So, there's no like middle layer or anything like that. Now, uh, I would just want to highlight the benchmarks involving heavy object access, uh, that the new approach is at least 20 times faster than MicroPython or duct tape, which is the JavaScript embeddable engine, and less than two times slower than V8. So you know, if you would to run V8 on those things, which I imagine would not really go that well, the uh, microcode like the compiling to the bytecode directly works a lot better, which is uh, pretty damn impressive, to be honest. So if you're interested in stuff like this, do check out the article and the paper itself. It is linked right here in the beginning. It is uh, fascinating uh, what people can achieve by <laughs> by compiling TypeScript and JavaScript to uh, bytecode essentially. Uh, it is open sourced, I believe. So there is there is, I don't know, like, I, I remember seeing the link somewhere, maybe it was in discussion, but there is a repo on GitHub. Let me see, is there, is there a number of code, blah, 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 mark and sweep. So this is all, no, that's not it. Um, just make code arcade. So I, re I definitely saw a repo on GitHub for that. And there we go, there it is. Yeah, so I, I guess it's not mentioned in the article at least, but there is a link somewhere, I remember finding it. There is a, a repo on GitHub, the whole thing is open sourced, and I think it's even like MIT licensed or something. So, you know, if you are curious about how that was built and uh, how does it work, you can just dive in and see, which is again, quite awesome. I'm absolutely loving the new Microsoft here. So there you go. If you want, you can get the source code as well. All right, continuing, we got um, another Twitter discussion. I just love those when this happens. So it's all started, I think it all started with Evan Yu, the author of UJS, 
posting this uh, image that compares the reactivity and different trade-offs in Vue.js, React, and Svelte. So if you're curious, do check it out. There's like some interesting points here, but this is not my favorite part. Like it's a pretty nice comparison, you know, all things considered. But um, then we got a reply from uh, Sebastian Markbridge, who is uh, one of the core, um, from the core team of the React that is titled, why is React doing this? That goes pretty in depth on a lot of this, uh, the criticism that was given to React in this comparison. Uh, and uh, other, you know, advantages of other frameworks in comparison to React, which was very interesting read. So there's like stuff, you know, like compiled output results in smaller apps. And then it's like swelled apps are smaller, but the compiler output is three, four larger per component than equivalent VDOM approach. And uh, Sebastian here goes into, you know, showing that, they, okay, so this is actually the uh, trade-off in terms of the application size. So we take a small application size, Yes, the application size for the Svelte will be smaller because there's not that many components. But as the application grows, the React will actually start winning because it bundles the VDOM into one nice bundle instead of, you know, uh, essentially bundling the whole components wrapper around each component, which essentially results in a larger component, like larger overall bundle, which is an interesting thing I haven't thought about before. There's also a bunch of other details here uh, in terms of, you know, using immutability versus the mutable references with, uh, so the comparison, wait a second, wait, let me just found the citation for you that explained it. Uh, yeah, so there is, wait a second, where was it? Um, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, so there you go. Uh, state mutation model through the composition. Okay, there's, no, wait a second, where was it? Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, there's mutable plus change tracking approach and there's a mutable plus referential equality testing approach. So this is the comparison of two of them. And then this goes, you know, to expand on that from the React Leaks implementation details through use Mimo. Uh, um, not a complaint, how do you call it? Criticism is what I want to say, right? So it's quite interesting to see um, how the React team basically views what they do. And I tend to agree with a lot of things that they put here. And uh, I mean, agree is the wrong word, right? Because there's nothing wrong about the, cre like there's nothing. How do I put that? Man, I'm really bad today. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. I tend to view things a lot in the same manner that the React core team does. I'm guessing because, primarily because I did dip into functional programming quite a lot. And I like the whole idea of immutability and referential equality, right? So, and because this is exactly what React does, right? And uh, yeah, it's it's very interesting to see this perspective. And it's also very interesting to read the answers from um, maintainers of other frameworks like Rich Harris, who did ch chip in, you know, with regards to Svelte and other stuff. Um, let me have a look at the chat. There are always heavy discussions on the Twitter when Evan Rich Harris, Seb, or Dan Abramov started talking about front-end framework. Yeah. Those discussions are awesome, by the way. So I'm totally into this. And I love reading them because there's always some little interesting details pop up that you never think about when you, you know, you just use the frameworks. And uh, this this discussion is no, exa no exception from that. So if you are curious, I would highly suggest you to go through that. And there's also some comments. There's, uh, I think Rich Harris is here. Yes, commenting on Svelte and addressing criticism to criticism. So uh, there you go. It is fascinating and awesome. So I quite highly suggest reading that. All right, next thing we got here is the summary of React hooks in just one tweet, which is absolutely on point and uh, makes, I think it makes um, explaining hooks a lot easier. So if you are still confused as to what's the difference between the use state and use ref, use effect, use reducer, use memo and use callback, maybe this tweet will clean it up for you. So just uh, check it out. All right, next thing we got here is uh, Hacktoberfest 2019 announcement. It is gonna happen. And the sponsors this year is DigitalOcean and Practical Dev, which is um, first of all, really awesome. And second of all, quite surprising to be honest that they are uh, you know already at the stage where they can actually f sponsor Hacktoberfest, but really great to see. So if you're interested in Hacktoberfest, uh, do start preparing. You will need to do several pull requests over the uh, duration of October as usual. 
and then you'll get some nice swag and you're gonna you know maybe do your first contribution to node.js or something else as i did last year which was uh, pretty fun to be honest so i'm quite looking forward to that all right um this is it for the tips tricks and bit sites awesomeness now we're coming to the releases section so the first major release of the week is firefox 69 it comes with a ton of improvements for the developers, including a bunch of new CSS properties, uh, add support selectors, uh, JavaScript public instance fields, uh, and resize observer. And there's another API that I never heard before about that is called microtasks. Uh, so apparently, in some cases, especially when you're working on a frameworks, set timeout and set immediate are not good enough for you. So you want to more control over the scheduling callbacks. And this is exactly why the queue microtask method is added so that you can do this microtask scheduling that is going to be guaranteed to be executed nearly uh, like in, in this micro queue, I guess. Like I haven't delved into the spec itself just yet, but it looks interesting. Like I've never heard about this API before ever, but now it is shipped in the Firefox 69. There's an explainer section in spec that basically this is what I'm planning to read next week once I have time, um, which explains why you need that. And it is fascinating. So, you know, if that sounds interesting. Do check it out. There is also obviously the um, Firefox 69 release notes for the uh, normal people, let's put the non developers, I guess. And um, the thing, like the things there, <clears throat> apologies. Uh, the things to keep in mind there is that they now, uh, this is, no, this is beta. Where is my uh, stable? Okay, whatever. So I just want to highlight that the, um, along with this release, they enabled the blocking of tracking cookies and <clears throat> a bunch of other privacy related features by default. So if you're, you, you need to recheck if your website works correctly in Firefox because it might break some things. So just keep that in mind. All right, um, next release we got here is a VS Code version 138 August release, which comes with a bunch of really awesome features like the preserve case for global search and replace, multi-line search, and uh, my favorite one, the MDN reference links for HTML and CSS. So now when you actually type in the CSS in your files, you will, you will get an MDN link that just shows you, <clears throat> apologies. Let me just get some water. Um, so <clears throat> you will actually get an MGN link that shows you the, <coughs> God damn it. Apologize. It shows you the Microsoft developer network docs for the specific CSS property that you were typing, which is uh, pretty damn good. You no longer have to search it manually. Right. Next release we got here is Babel version 7.6 that adds private static accessors and V8 intrinsic syntax support. So private static accessors is the final uh, part of the private static fields spec, I believe. And now it's just completed in Babel at least. And uh, yeah, so the V8 intrinsic runtime functions parsing is something that is now supported. I think this is like this is a non-standard extension to the language basically and you can only use it when you pass the allow native syntax uh, command line flag to v8 which is i like I, I guess it could be good for like profiling and stuff like this right but uh, i never had to use it so i'm not even sure why would you do that but uh, there we go they also added the newlish coalescing operator uh, like updated it not added it uh, to comply with the new spec and uh, that's basically it. So it's minor update. All right, next thing we got here is Node.js version 12.10 as being a minor update. There's nothing, uh, not that many things of Node, but I just wanted to highlight one feature that is my personal favorite. There is now a recursive option to RM Deer call. Finally, after how many versions of Node.js, we finally got it. And now you can recursively remove folders without having to install a third party dependency for that. So uh, yeah, that's that's a good thing. All right, now we're coming to the libraries and demos section. The first library we got here today is Recharge, a composable charging library built on React components. I've never seen that before. It looks absolutely awesome. It uses SVG to render the charts. It has animations and it has a very nice and simple API and a tons of variety of charts. So if you're working with data, 
And if you wanted to have a nice chart library that works nicely with React, then do check this one out. It actually looks really good. Next thing we got here is um, <laughs> every time I open it, I just go, oh, no, that's not that. Like it's, it's written as AWW, but I'm not sure how to read that properly. <laughs> So it's a sync iterables interface for web workers. It allows you to wrap your web workers in a sync iterable interface and then consume it as if it was a sync iterable. It's just one step from turning it into the communicating sequential processes, the CSP um, you know, approach that is used, for example, for concurrency and Golang, but it's not quite there. So it's just like a sync iterable. I, I guess it might be useful for some cases. So maybe you know why, just uh, check it out. It, I mean, it's nonetheless a pretty nice library to at least learn uh, from how to build stuff like this. Okay, next thing we got here is React Spinners CSS, collection of React Spinner components of CSS spinners for Ajax and loading animations. There is a ton of them. They are basically pure CSS. You can customize them if you want to. And uh, yeah, it looks, looks quite nice. So uh, just another spinner collection, but maybe you'll like this one more because it has, for example, heart shape loading animation, which is uh, nothing, I think not something you commonly see, but uh, there we go. Right. Next thing we got here is VS Code Dashboard, a speed dial like uh, project dashboard for VS Code. So it just shows off your latest projects that are been open recently. And you know, if you're too lazy to go into the file open recent, you can just do this from the dashboard. That sounds interesting. Do check it out seems to be quite okay. I personally, I think I personally just use open recent either or using command shift P in the command pane to just open the whatever I need. But yeah, Okay, next thing we got here is Chakra UI. Um, this is essentially a simple modular and accessible component library for building uh, websites. It's yeah, uh, accessibility seems to be one of the core propositions as well as being themable and composable. It has quite a decent component library and the default styling is also quite nice. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. It does have like stuff, more obscure stuff like toasts and I mean, I guess tags is not that obscure, but uh, yeah, switches even. So looks pretty nice, works with React, uh, accessible and everything. Maybe this is what you were looking for. All right, next thing we got here is Mali, a minimalistic gRPC framework, uh, microservice framework for Node.js. So if you wanted to build microservices using gRPC, this seems to be like a nice option. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is hash IDs JS, a small JavaScript library to generate YouTube like IDs from numbers. Use it when you don't want to expose your database IDs to the user. Uh, so yeah, essentially just, you know, hash ID and then return the hash to user. And then it's basically deterministic. So you can just reproduce it every time and link it back to the user, which is uh, quite convenient. So if, if that sounds like something useful, do check it out. Next thing, and I think this is the last demo we have for today is Bitmelo. This is an all-in-one uh, playground slash editor for building games in a browser. Has a tile editor, has a tile map, has a sound editor, has a code editor and a project setup. So you can actually build your games right in here. I think like it's basically also has like the engine and everything. So um, yeah, you can, you know, um, for some reason my, there we go, our button does work in. It, it is a bit silly, but seems quite nice. So if you wanted to build your games or maybe you wanna teach some kids to build the games, this looks like a nice option. All right, and before we wrap this up, I have two interesting links. The first one is your calendrical fallacy is, and this is a collection uh, that helps you to navigate the insane complexity of calendrically correct date and time operations. And if you never worked with calendars and dates, then you might wanna read through that because you know when you look at the calendar, you think, well, this thing is easy, right? So you just have like time zone and then you have like the start of the week and you're done. And then you start delving into the details and it's like days are exactly 24 hours long, which is not true because we have leap forward, leap backward, and they might be 23 or 25 hours long. And then we got um, some times when the same hour occurs twice a day. And then there's um, some weeks that not start on Sunday or Monday. And there's the weekends that are not Saturday and Sunday. 
And it's like 25 more things that I never know existed. So if you're curious, do read it. It is absolutely terrifying. And I really hope I will never need to work with something like this. Because this is damn scary. Now, there's also actually pointers on how to um, how to address this. So there's an ICU project that basically has the guidelines for uh, correctly working with dates and calendars, which is uh, quite awesome, especially after you read through that thing. So yeah. All right. And the last thing here is the dumb password rules, the shaming sites with dumb password rules. Um, it's been recently updated and yes, that's still a thing in 2019. We still have a websites that ask you to build, uh, to come up with a passwords that are 12 characters long and have one special symbol, but not that special symbol in them. And yes, Apple is also here and, um, it is just beyond silly. Like <laughs> the rules on some of those, you know, if you are responsible for building an authentication system and someone tries to tell you to restrict the password length to, well, anything, to be honest, like minimum length, I get it, you know, like minimum eight characters, that sounds fine, six characters, that's whatever, you know, so just some minimal length makes some kind of sense, right? Maximal length doesn't make any sense. Please don't do that. Uh, as well as any other restrictions. I mean, we already have UTF-8 and you're probably gonna store your password as a hash. So who cares what's in there, right? As long as you hash correctly and the hash is deterministic, it doesn't matter what the string is. So why do we care? But um, apparently we do for some reason. So there you go. Now, if you're curious, do check it out. There are some absolutely hilarious rules here and there. Yes, PayPal is also in this list. I still remember that when I tried to generate a hundred symbol password for my PayPal using my password manager and was like, no, you can't do that. I was like, damn it. That was, um, uh, yeah, not very fun experience. But yeah, um, that's basically all I have here for today. This was BX Series Weekly episode 79. If you guys have any questions or suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. I will be happy to answer anything or highlight your work or maybe I missed some articles, do throw them in right now as well. If not, then you as usual, you can find all the links on a GitHub or on bxjs.dev. Uh, the VOD will be available on Twitch immediately after the stream and on YouTube after a couple of hours once I re-upload that. Um, yeah, as usual, if you want to discuss any of that, feel free to join our Discord server uh, where we chat about JavaScript and video games from time to time. Um, yeah, but uh, I don't know how to pronounce how to. <laughs> oh, okay. Hello. We got the author of all here. Um, man, I, yeah, it's like, it's really hard. Like I get it, you know, when you write it, it's not that hard, but when you want to pronounce it, it's like, uh, have you used all oh, JS? <laughs> that sounds terrible to be honest. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a nice, nice library. So there we go. Author of the library also doesn't know how to pronounce it. Okay. Um, well, we covered this part. So yes, coming back to my uh, shilling. Um, coming back to my shilling, as I said, we have a Discord server. So if you want to chat, join up, I'm more than happy to help you with any JavaScript problems you might have. Uh, if you want to see announcements for the upcoming streams, there is my Twitter account. I also announced them on the Discord server uh, and uh, that's about it, I think. Um, yeah, that's basically it from my side. So um, if you guys, again, have any more questions or suggestions, throw them into the chat. If no, then let's just wrap this up here. It was just half an hour. That was really damn quick. For some reason, we did not have any news this week. But, uh, you know, we got some stuff. So I'm hoping the next week will be more. Inter I mean, we, we did have the... Um, static subset for web uh, TypeScript, right? Which was pretty damn impressive. This is probably the most interesting news this week. But there we go. All right, doesn't seem like there's any more questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Um, as usual, thank you for your support. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or awesome rest of the week if you're watching the VOD of this. And I see you next time. Bye.